from the corner ahead of another huge night of matchroom boxing action on Sunday night. Lawrence Acoli defending his Cruiserweight world title uh, under the O2 Arena, uh, an arena where we've seen so much great action over the years. But this is where we get the inside track from the trainers, and I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by three men who know exactly what they are talking about when it comes to the tactics. I'm joined by Shane McGuigan, who, of course, is looking after Lawrence Acoli on Sunday night, as well as uh, Anthony Fowler. Great to have you with us, Shane. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Uh, also joined by two-time world, cha two weight world champion, in actual fact, uh, Ricky Hatton, of course, so father and manager, let me get this right, of Campbell Hatton, who, of course, is fighting on Sunday night. Welcome. And, of course, his uncle, his trainer, a former European champion, Matthew Hatton, as well, who, despite the fact that he is a big red, of course, has to wear a Manchester City badge on his shirt, oh, which, crazy. of course... That's a good <laughs> Brilliant. Good Boys, it's absolutely brilliant to, to have all of you do, uh, here tonight. Um, Shane, I'll start with you, because, obviously, you've got uh, the biggest fight of the lot here on, on Sunday night, Lawrence Acoli. Um, just talk us through a little bit about how much Lawrence has changed since you took over training for him. Well, look, I mean, he was um, he went to Olympics after 26 fights. I think he only had 26 amateur fights and um, turned pro, won British Commonwealth um, title and then obviously come to me. Um, so it wasn't like I was getting a complete novice. Do you know what I mean? I was getting a guy that was had raw power, six foot five, um, big long reach as well. So, um, But he was a bit clumsy with his work smothered his work a lot um and you know i think over the years he come in early 2019 and now we're into 2022 so he's uh he's really improving all the time and i think it's just repetition all the time in the gym Do you know what i mean trying to keep him in the gym as much as possible working on just the fundamentals because he's got all of the raw uh, attributes that you need to be a to be a world champion and you know he's a, he's been he's been a world champion after 16 16 fights so yeah Matthew, how different is it in that respect then when you've got somebody like Campbell who's coming in as effectively a, a raw novice and you're taking him straight into the, to the pro game? Yeah, it's um, obviously it's difficult, you know, Campbell, not the most experienced uh, amateur, very young as well, big pressure uh, on his shoulders. So as we've said, it's always going to be work in progress, you know, it, it wasn't going to, uh, we're looking for Campbell to become a star in the in the next two or three years it, it's not going to happen overnight Campbell would still probably be an amateur now if it wasn't for the pandemic um you know we'd probably be looking at him turning professional now but we couldn't have him fighting you know go, go two years without a fight so we, we decided to make the move and um yeah you know he's he's he's, he's showed improvement last time um, he, he's getting used to the occasion. He's handling the pressure better. And uh, he was excellent in his last fight. So I, I hope that trend's going to continue now. When you look at uh, the Hatton name, as it is, Ricky, given all that you achieved over the years, do you worry? How, how, how worried are you by the possibility that, that Campbell is going to have all that media attention, all that spotlight resting on his shoulders? Well, <clears throat> like you say, he's, you know, he started very young. I think he started about 40, 13, 14, didn't he? Do you know what I mean? He started pretty young. It only had like 20, 24, 26 amateur fights. It really is nothing. And you know, it was a you know his, his debut was a was a, was a big thing. You know, he was on mo morning television. He'd never done interviews before in his life. He was on morning breakfast shows. They had a documentary on him. There was this big build up, and he's had through that. He's been on big, massive, massive cards. You know, none bigger than the AJ um, uh, undercard when. There was 70,000 fans there. I didn't even fight in front of 70,000 fans. He was on just before AJ. It was, it was packed. And it, it got to him a little bit. When, and with the with the name on his on his shoulders, but bearing in mind all that stuff, well, his best performance was his last performance. You know, and that speaks, uh, you know, speaks volumes, you know. And um, I think he'll be better for it. I mean, a lot of pressure for him. He's had the big build-up, but I think he'll be better for it. You know, now he's got his head around the, you know, the facts, and I think he'll be better for it. Yeah. Shane, the, the name it can have a major impact, can't it? When you, you're part of a boxing family. I mean, for you, I don't think your dad actually wanted you to, to be a fighter, did he? When you were a, a youngster? No, he didn't. No, and I was at I was at boarding school down in Somerset, and I just started um, literally taking the, the bus down to the local gym, and then he found out. So, um, yeah, it, it, it comes with a lot of pressure. So I can really relate to um, Campbell because, you know, when I was boxing myself, I couldn't even have a go to a club show without it being put on last. 
Yeah, I mean, I was did, a, did I, I hear? I was right? saying with Campbell, wasn't it, Matthew, for the period as an amateur? Yeah, yeah. You put him top of the bill, yeah. And I was like, oh, for crying out loud, it was. Yeah. yeah. You're sitting there, and all the juniors go on, and then all the seniors go on, and then you're a junior going on last. Absolutely, it's yeah. the same thing with me all the time. They they try and keep the crowd in there, and, it, and it's just a lot of pressure. What did you do in that? Because I, I heard that that you'd ch actually go in and, and change your name, so you wouldn't tell yeah, everybody that yeah. you were a McGuigan because you had that pressure. Yeah, for the first few fights, I, I, I went underneath my um, my middle name, but Dad was in the crowd, and everyone could tell. <laughs> <laughs> so at some point, he knew, uh, and you must have had a conversation that that this is what you wanted to do. Was it was it difficult to go through that process? Um, not really, no, because he, like he used to drive. I mean, I, like he lives in uh, just outside Whitstable. He would drive two hundred miles to come and pick me up to take me sparring, and then. I'd spar, and then he'd drive 200 miles back. So he, he said, look, if you're going to do it, I'm going to be a part of it and make sure you looked after because, you know, I think over the seven or eight years I was boxing, I don't think I sparred more than four or five times without him being there. And it was a nice thing to have because you know what it's like. You go to gyms and you walk into to the gym, and if you're a son of someone like my dad or Ricky or, you know, even, even Matthew, do you know what I mean? You, you're going to go in there and people are going to try and knock you out. And it's like they'll always try that little bit harder and they'll go. I used to go over to Earlsfield Amateur Gym and they'd always try and pick their gloves, the most punched out ones. I was thinking, fuck, man, give, give me a set of them gloves. Do you know what I mean? So we used to go, we used to go sparring with like three or four sets of gloves because if they were taking the piss, I'd put on my ones that were taking the piss. And it's like, it's just the way, it's just the way it is. It's, you know, you, you've always got that, they want to be the person that, that, that chins you. Do you know what I mean? So it's it kind of it makes you step up. And it's also... funny, Shane, but when Campbell used to go, we'd just have the immediate family there. Whether yeah. it be me, Matt, you know, yeah. you know, my mum, my dad, you know, you know, Jenna, you know, Jack, and everything like that, and they'd have coach loads coming to cheer them on, weren't they? And I thought, oh, you know, they'd be cheering for like, where's all these come from? It, it must it must have been hard for them. It must have been hard, and fun for yourself, yeah, yeah. So when Matthew, so when, when Camel made that decision, and, and Matthew, you were you were sort of given the opportunity to, to train him. Did you feel a bit of pressure because of that, because of the family name as well? Well, you know, it was how I initially got involved with Campbell was um, he was he was having his amateur fights, and he, he was win some, lose some, and I could see attributes in him physically and mentally. You know, he, he was very resilient. And I thought he's capable of so much more. Um, and I thought, I'm not having somebody come up to me. I mean, I've always had a close relationship with Campbell, anybody, anyway. Um, but I thought he was capable of so much more. And I thought, I'm in a position, I'm coaching myself, I can help him. So at that stage, I offered to do, you know, start doing more and more work with him, as Ricky did. Um, and then I started doing more and more work. So when he decided, we, did, we decided to, for him to turn professional, uh, it was a natural progression uh, for me to train him because I'd, I'd been doing the bulk of the work of him for some time. Initially, I just stepped in. I could see him fighting. I thought I knew I was in a position to help him. And he was working so hard. We all lived close together. I'd see him running. And it was frustrating going, watching him, seeing him losing to opponents. He shouldn't really have been losing to. Like Shane said, you would see kids trying out their skin, you know, with all the supporters coming. But I was in a position to help him. And uh, and that's what I did. So I started working with him more and more. And that's why we, were, we, we are where we are today. Yours is an interesting story, Shane, in the sense that obviously these two have had illustrious professional careers but for you you had a great amateur career but then decided that turning pro wasn't for you what what was the the thought process going on at that time that then made you decide you wanted to become a trainer i sat and reflected and i thought would i be happy winning the british title would i be happy winning a, a, a european title and um if i was going to go into the professional ranks i wanted to be a world champion and i wanted to try and emulate what my dad did and i really truly believe that I wasn't going to be good enough. Um, you know, I, I, I had a very good pro style. I could I could fight, I could fight at pace, but I was an attacking fighter. I was going to be walking into punches. <laughs> I was trying to emulate my dad's style. Um, and he was a featherweight, high paced, moved his head a lot. Um, and I thought with my size, I was going to be walking into <laughs> people like Golovkin. And am I tough enough? Am I good enough to go and win a world title? And I, I genuinely believe that I'd enjoyed my experience as a, as a boxer and I didn't, you know, it wouldn't have fulfilled me to have, have only won. I'm not d discouraging anyone winning a British or anything like that, but I just would have always thought I would have always tried to achieve the most. And I think it was the right decision for me in hindsight because 
I was able to take my experiences from boxing and put it into... That must have been a really difficult thing to yeah. admit to yourself, yeah, I suppose, was, I mean, was it? But I think you've, you, you've, got to, you've got to be honest with yourself. And that's, that's the thing. And that's, that's the thing about being a coach. You've also got to be honest with your fighters. Um, you've got to manage their expectations. And, um, you know, like there's, there, there's so many experiences that you can learn from boxing. You know, you don't always have to, you don't always have to win and, and achieve great heights. You, you know, you can, boxing can fulfill you in so many ways and you can learn a lot from just literally being involved in it. And I felt like I'd, I'd, I'd been involved and I'd, I'd done my part <laughs> of boxing for, you know, seven, seven or eight years and, and I'd achieved more than I set out to in terms of originally, I just want to get some weight off <laughs> and then I'm winning, uh, some fights and I'm enjoying it. And then it become, it became my whole life. So, um, look, I'm, I, you know, I, I enjoyed my experience with it, but, but moving into the coaching, I mean, I originally, I didn't actually want anything to do with boxing. I was just sick of it. I just was, I mean, I remember Kenny Egan after the Olympics in 2008, he came over and did some training with me because he was <coughs> struggling. He was, he was drinking a lot. And, um, and he trained with me for two weeks and he says, I couldn't do it. Because I was living in my dad's house and I was training two to three times a day and I was overdoing it because that was my dad's mentality. So I learned a lot of things from from um, from boxing and also knowing that everyone's cut differently. Um, and, you know, you've got to tailor everything to, to that individual. We'll talk about your, your methods and how you do things in, in, in a little while. But I just want to talk about the trainers that you've worked with, both of you in particular with, with Billy Graham. And, and a lot of people will probably look at him and think, well, yeah, he's kind of a, an old school style trainer. Is, is that fair? Do you, do you agree with that? Um, it was very old school. When you look at the different training methods that they use today, as far as just strength work and nutrition and, and stuff like that, I think Billy, you know, it will be an old school trainer, but he was ahead of his time. I was doing heavyweights. We were all doing weights, weren't we, at the gym? And we had, you know, Kerry Kays who was doing nutrition, and Kerry Kays was the absolute best. I mean, to get me from three stone down, you know, <laughs> To remain remain with the strength and the pace that I had in 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 in, in the fights, you know, was in, unbelievable. I think, but I think if Kerry was here, as good as Kerry as Kerry was, and he was the absolute best, nutrition and strength work has has come on even from back then. Do you know what I mean? And Billy Graham was you know before his time. You know, back at the time when Billy was training, they said, "Don't use weights. No, don't lose weights. They slow you down." And you know, it was. As as it's proved now, it was the, it was the biggest load of rubbish going, and Billy Graham was heavily into the to the weights, and you know, weight training is very good, as long exceptional for me, as long as you know the technique is good, and you know, and, and you know the the weights and the strength work has got to gear around the boxing, you know that the the boxing and is paramount. There's no point in lifting weights, but everything every every weight that was lifted was geared to how I'd say shift me body weight or transfer me body weight, you know. You know, and that's when the weights benefit. And Billy knew that from a very early age, but at a very early time. But um, yeah, he would be seen as an old school trainer now. But he was he was before his time, definitely. Yeah. What about you, Matthew? I mean, I remember going into that Phoenix gym many, many a time, and seeing the, the lot of you training together. And Billy and Kerry Cage, they were a great combination working together. Those two and Bobby Rimmer and people like that in there. It was a it was a great gym at the time, wasn't it? With some great stars. It wasn't, like Shane said, everyone's different, some great characters, and they all moulded together really, really well. You know, been very fortunate. You know, a lot of fights, boxed all over the world, trained all over the world, and I always had one eye on becoming a trainer. It's something that always interested me, even when I was in the middle of my own career. So very fortunate, really. But like you say, training has, has, has moved on, and uh, I think a combination of the two is good, you know, um, training techniques change and you've got to go with that. But also there's there's nothing wrong with saying to a kid, right, I'm at the top of the hill. Don't stop till you get to the top. So it's getting a combination of the two. You've got to move with the times. And and, and we're all listening and, and learning as we go on. We go to different gyms, we see different things, and that's how we all learn. Shane, you've quite famously taken that kind of approach, haven't you, in terms of um, looking at things from a very sort of holistic perspective, not only just in terms of, of training fighters to fight, but nutrition, mm. um, science, um, um, all that kind of stuff, conditioning, strength work, et cetera, et cetera. So you're looking at every little individual aspect in a lot of ways. Yeah, I mean, I, I was always looking for an edge, you know, but this is a skilled sport. It's a, it's a skilled sport and it's, it, it comes down to who wants it the most sometimes. And um, I massively agree with what you just said. It's like, 
kids kids coming through especially amateur kids they need to be pushed out of their comfort zone i remember talking to george grove saying that his dad used to get him up get him up and get him to run eight to ten miles and that was when he was a kid that just instilled that level of determination and, and ambition in him and at the end of george's career we were reining everything back in it depends where they're at in their career someone like campbell would would need to be doing those trying to spar three to four times a week tr trying to get as many rounds in as possible because he's in the learning phase and also you know, but when he gets to 28, 29, you're going to be trying to bring the spine back, the wear and tear on the body, um, maybe not pushing the, the weights to the to the absolute max, you know, because the strength's already built then. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're always looking at that ledge, especially from a nutrition um, standpoint as well. So it's uh, the, the, there's 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 like certain variables to make certain fighters. But if you're a come forward fighter like Ricky, you, know, you need to be as physically strong and, and, and high pace and as fit as possible and, and get that weight perfect so that he's able to hold a, the best shot possible. But then you've also got people like Luke Campbell, who I used to work with, that would be, that didn't really matter. It was, you know, his 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 sort of uh, selling point was his boxing and, and, and his sort of just trying to walk people onto shots. So we never, what, it's, it's working with individual opponent, uh, individual yeah, fighters. You're all built differently, aren't you? You're, he's, you're exactly. built different to me. He has a different exactly. style to you, and you, you know, and it, that's it's getting the best gel for that particular boxer, isn't it? Is that the key to success? Then is is it all about as as well as having those <clears throat> fundamentals, the basic fundamentals of, of of being able to fight, being able to to find the the right plan the right nutrition, the the right way of fighting for each individual and tailoring every single little bit I you think can so, because we all we all have a different style. We all have a different work rate. We all have a different frame and a different size, you know what I mean? And it's and I was I, I learned a lot when I was boxing for England when I was at Crystal Palace. I learned a hell of a lot, even to this day, still things that I learned as an amateur I still use now as a professional as a and as a, a professional trainer. But I, you know, we used to go to Crystal Palace and we did the same drills, the same pads, the same moves, the same this, and you know, and and what I've learned over the years, you know, is that you know everyone's built differently. You know, you got you know you've got to look at that individual right now. That you know the weights, the heavy weights, you know, and and the strength work will work for Ricky because he's he fights at close quarters. He's a bit of grappling and pushing, and you know, and that was my game was able to sap the strength of my opponent not by just leaning and tugging and pulling and you know. And, and stuff like that, but then you know, like like Shane said, you got like a Luke Campbell who likes to box up different, use his height, whip them, whip them shots in. So a different approach would be needed for Luke Campbell than for Ricky Hatton. Yeah. And I think that's you know the that's what makes a you know a, a, you know that's what makes a good trainer is you know looking at you know don't say this is this is what I got taught, so you're all doing the same. You know what I mean? You've got to look you know, and I think that's just moving with the times, isn't it? Boxing's changed, you know, yeah, from a, from a nutrition and strength or a technique point of view. I think we've all got to look at the individual and say, right, I'm going to train you this way. Maybe doing this certain exercise isn't for you, and that's and I think that's I think that's what Shane was getting at there. Yeah, exactly right. And um, you know, we've all got no doubt we've all been to gyms, and it's a it's a one cap fits all, and and that isn't the way how you train people. And we're talking just purely about physically and, and different training techniques. It's mentally as well. Everybody needs treating ment mentally different. You know, some people need a stroke. Some people, you need a stick. Um, you know, you, some people, you know, need a, a strong word. And other people need softly, softly. So that's all part of being, being a good coach. Again, everybody's different, training them physically differently and also mentally how to treat them. Um, and how to get the best out of them on the night of the fight. Everyone's different. Does that ring true with your gym as well, would you say? You, you've got to treat everybody differently. And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Does it take a long time or, does, or do you know fairly quickly how to, to treat a particular individual when, when they're under your wing? Well, I think the, the, the good thing, well, one of the main factors of being a, a good coach is being able to relate to that person. It's like you've almost got to go to their level all the time um, and, and adapt to them. You can't be stubborn. A lot of... A lot of for, former fighters will say, "Well, this is the way it worked for me." As as Ricky just said, then that's you know that's a one sort of you know it, one thing fits all. But it's that's not the case. You've got to you've got to be able to figure out why it, it doesn't work for them, or you know where they struggle with nerves. And and I I always say it's just another sparring session. That's all it is. Just with a little bit of crowds and smaller gloves on. It's exactly the same. You do it three times a week. There's no difference. 
Um, but you know, there's there's one thing saying, and then also trying to you know be able to to, to, to tame them in that sense. So, um, and then also you got the you got the headers as well out there, the guys that when they get a little bit of money and bit of fame, they just go way off the rails, and you're you're having a you know become a, a parent to them almost. You know, I've had I've had fighters over over the, my 12 years of coaching that have lived with me, um, and you know, spent bought watches spent money on cars and been selling them before their next fight and there's there's loads of loads of uh things that go on behind the scenes that you know, as a coach you need to be able to not just give them boxing advice give them personal life um information and, and try and try and encourage them to to really uh, this is a long process and, of course, exactly, and you know if, they're, I mean? if they're ha- if they're not happy outside the four walls of yeah. the gym you're not going to get the best out of them in the four, yeah. four walls are they and he's uh you spend every day of your working life with them, don't you? So you have that closeness and you get to know how they tick and different ones need need the arm round. Like Matthew said, need the arm round and then some people need a bit of a, a, a telling off and I think you, you do get close to because you work with them every day but you have to become a little bit of a father figure and if you know how they tick and you become that little bit of a father figure then you get better out of them in the gym, don't you? Just keep your mic up, Rick. Sorry. Cool. Yeah. Um, speaking of going off the rails... Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, mate. I couldn't couldn't resist. But I mean, we all know, obviously, in between fights, you'd enjoy a, a, a beverage or two and a, maybe a pie or two, wouldn't you? And I was there with you many a time. Um, but it is difficult when you see it now, and, and you've got to try and convince fighters that they've got to try and live the life. I mean, how much advice are you giving to Campbell, for example, yeah, to, well, to make sure that he's not doing some of the things that other fighters might be doing? Manchester boxing went through a bit of a period. There was fighters coming up behind me, like John Murray, for for instance, was a, was a prime example. And because I used to balloon up in my weight, get my weight off, and get away with it, and win what I won and perform what I did, I think there was like a trend going around Manchester where youngsters were coming up and going, and when they were going, what? you doing you're putting weight on what do that and it was like Ricky Hatton did it and it made me it made me cringe I used to think God is this the example I'm I'm saying but I mean personally I wouldn't change change anything personally from what I did because I was a little jack the lad I think that's why I, I had the following that I did do but I mean as far as Campbell and my boxers that are in the gym now and I think Matthews obviously trains Campbell I think you speak for Matthew in this sense if they if he did anything remotely like what I did I'll tell you what they'd get they get an absolute thick ear. My my fighters, the way before every session, the way after every session, after so many weeks, I want them a certain weight so we can judge, you know, where they're at, so how they get the rounds out. If they have a, like a few days off or a week off, you can't come back any more than that. And you know, it's because I think I could have. I think it was not to say I couldn't have done even better than what I did if I hadn't, you know, done it with one hand behind my back and burnt the candle up, you know, at both ends. I could have maybe got a couple of more years at it, you know, you know, if I hadn't have uh, burnt the candle up that, both ends. That's what my dad says when he was too disciplined because <laughs> he said he overtrained. He didn't yeah. drink. Well, it's a, it's you know a, it's, so. You've got to be right in the middle, you know what I mean? There was fighters uh, that used to come in my gym, like Denton Vassell, mm. And Scott Quigg, who, who was, who was not, obviously not in my oh, Scott was an absolute were, gym rat, wasn't he? He was, too he was never out yeah. the gym. Denton Vassell used to do 12 rounds of sparring, and he didn't even have a date. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, you know, you don't you don't, you don't, don't do the Banny McGuigan, and you don't do the Ricky Hatton. That's where Somewhere you, in between. That's where you try and go. <laughs> Somewhere in between. A little bit more nice, near yeah. a Barry, though, I have to say. <laughs> the, the difference <laughs> these days, though, Matt, I think, is these things, isn't it? Because there's no way that you guys would have been able to get away with half the stuff you did when you were you were well, fighting. I, I got in trouble with him without that, so... <laughs> Well, we we live in a little village. Um, I'm talking about Campbell specifically. We we live in a, a little village called G Cross, sort of place where everyone knows ev- everyone's business. So Campbell can't fight with, without us knowing. Trust me, <laughs> we know exactly what he's done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> one thing I'm I'm interested in though, Shane, is is when you've got a stable like the, the one that you have at the moment, and you've got you know world champions in there and and fighters who are really upcoming and what have you. How difficult is it for you to spread yourself around? How difficult is it for you to make sure that you're giving everybody the attention that they need? Because there's only one of you and there's obviously half a dozen or more of them. Yeah, I'd start earlier and i finish later. <laughs> um, I've got nine in the gym at the moment um, and quite a lot of them are championship fighters. So it would have been all right if there was six of them uh, that were not 12 round, you know, six round or four round fighters because they don't need as much time. But the fact that I've got Dan Dubois is going to be fighting for a title in, in April 23rd. I've got Lawrence out. This is my fourth week on the spin and we've had six fighters out. So 
Um, I've got a great right hand man in um, Josh Pritchard. So just making sure that, that he tapes their hands up and then I give them their 45 minutes to an hour. But it's, yeah, I'm in there first thing in the morning and I finish late on. And, and if they're far away from a fight, then they then they go at the end of the day, three or, three or four o'clock. And if they're like Lawrence, for instance, who's boxing this weekend, they go earlier in the day, they get the prime slot, says, what time do you want? Um, and then we just base their whole training around it. So, you know, I've got, I used to employ the strength and conditioning coach and I used to do all that and try and control everything. But, you know, they're add-ons really, um, all of that sort of stuff. And I think every fighter wants to work with certain nutritionists or certain strength coaches or, you know, they've, some of them have, have their own management and stuff. So um, I just try and manage manage my time as, as best possible, really. A lot of the trainers that I talk to when we, when we, we speak to them in, in these sorts of things is they'll say that it's it's very much like a family. The gym mm. is like a family. And for you guys, obviously, it very much is family. Does that ever cause any problems? Are there ever times when you think, well, maybe we're not looking at, at things as objectively sometimes as perhaps we, we should do? Does Does the family aspect sometimes become more of a difficulty than, than maybe it does uh, uh, help sometimes, do you think? Not really. I mean, it's me and me and Ricky obviously been brought together, always been so close, and, and we've had a lot of the same trainers. So it's funny, actually, sometimes we'll be in the changing rooms or we'll be in the gym, and um, just as I'm about to say something, Rick will already come in and, and say it to him. So a lot of the time, uh, again, we've had a lot of the same coaches, both very experienced in the sport. So invariably, you know, I'm sure it'd be the same for Ricky. Ricky might be about to say something and, and I beat him to it. So a lot of the time, obviously, we always sit down and discuss Campbell's career. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of experience uh, around Campbell and he's got to tap into all of that. Um, we always sit down and, and plan the next moves and stuff like that. But a lot of the time, there's been no issues so far. Me and Ricky, a lot of the times, are on the same page. We had a lot of the same coaches. So... Um, no, working really well at the minute. Are you two second guessing each other a lot of the time? Then do you say? Yeah, so it's, it's, and that's um, <clears throat> that's nice. I mean, sometimes you know, and it's the same with Campbell. You know, he'll, he'll say something to me, won't he? And I'll go, you know, and he's he's saying to me what I was thinking, and probably it's the same with with with, with, with Matthew. Sometimes Campbell will come up with something, and we think, well, I'm glad he's no he's noticed it before I'm saying it. So that's a good thing because me and Billy Graham, we we could make we could we could do contact without saying anything. He'd just look at me. He said, "You know what happened in that round, don't you? You know why you didn't do that, and that happened, you know." And I, and I, I know it. And we, I think we have, you know, that relationship of the advice that we give Campbell. And I think Campbell's bouncing. He's on the same wavelength. He pretty much, when he comes, I think when Campbell comes back to the corner in, in between the round. Now he was his coach. The pleasing thing is Campbell already knows what he's done wrong before Matthew fills in the gap. Do you know what I mean? Like I say, Campbell has, has been around it, he's seen it, he's been around it, you know, subconsciously he's taken in. He's refreshing to train because it's it's amazing how uneducated some of these boxers are when it comes to nutrition and training methods. Some of these guys have been good amateurs and had good amateur careers and it's amazing how little they know where I don't have that problem with Campbell because he's, he's seen it, he's been around it. Um, we've always had very high expectations. That was drill, drilled into me and Ricky as a kid, and that's exactly what we've got for him. How much do you get involved in terms of when it comes to, to coming up with, with opponents? Because obviously we look at Cheslak that uh, we've got uh, coming up this weekend for, for Lawrence O'Colian and you look at his record and the people he's fought and what have you, and you think, yeah, that's, that's a really hard, hard fight. But that's what, exactly what, what Lawrence wanted. But were you happy with that? Was that exactly the way you were going at the same time on the same page? Yeah, we, we wanted the winner of Gulamarian versus Egorov, but it got called off uh, with 24 hours to go. They just weighed in. Uh, and one of them, I think uh, Gulamarian got COVID. So uh, we were disappointed that we didn't get a unification on, on this fight. But Eddie sort of put put a few offers to us. He said that Maccabi was looking at the Canelo fight and... Um, that Gulamari and Egorov is going to be res rescheduled and Marius Bredis is more interested in trying to fight Jake Paul. So the next best opportunity for us was uh, to fight Michael Seslak. So, look, I am speak to uh, 258 all the time. I speak to Eddie a, a lot. Do you know what I mean? I've got nine fights. We, we manage seven of them. So we're always there you know, negotiating back and forth and also trying to plan the right route for, for the boxers. But Seslak is... I think it's going to be a perfect fight for Lawrence because he doesn't try and maul him. I think, you know, Lawrence 
sh- showcases his best sort of skills and he's able to get get his shots off whenever guys are s- sort of trying to box with him. Um, and I, I think he'll walk him onto a shot and I think it's going to be a, 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 a massive statement, as it were, because he's only been beaten the one time and that was a, a, a dubious decision loss to Maccabre, who's, an, who's a WBC champion. And you mentioned Canelo there, which is interesting because obviously <coughs> one of the biggest names in boxing in the world right now and there's been talk about him even going up to cruiserweight and, and it's been talked about as, as Lawrence being a, a possibility. I mean, you, is that do you even entertain that? I'll bet, I'll bet my house that he'd never, never box... Uh, Canelo. Canelo doesn't want to box someone at six foot five um, because he knows that out of the out of the champions up at cruiserweight, that the one to go for is is Macabre. He's only about five eleven, six foot. Um, he's been knocked out a few times, and um, it. I don't think he's going to be mixing it up at two hundred pounds for very long. It's up, it's going up there, a bit like Roy Jones when he went up to box Andy Ruiz Jr. It's get Ruiz up job there, and get back down. <laughs> get up there, get your title, <laughs> yeah. come straight back down because he's going to lose. He's going to. He's. He wouldn't want to lose from a from a, a physical point of view. He's you know. Canelo is the sort of guy that understands himself. He'll want to. He'll if he does get beaten, he'll want to get beaten by skill, not not by physicality. Lawrence would love it though, wouldn't he? Lawrence would. <laughs> yeah, it would be an awkward fight, but you know, he'd be punching down at his ankles. But you know. incredible to yeah. um, to think of when you think of Lawrence that um, when he first started, and it's credit to Shane with what he's done. When to think of, he didn't have the best looking style, did he? He wasn't. A, you know. You know, it, you know. At times, it was. You know, it was. It was wasn't the wasn't the best style to watch. But how he's turned his career now when you see him now, the the leverage and the whip he gets in his shots by, you know, just giving that little bit of distance which he never he never had. And now we're talking about him with possible fights of Canelo from where he come from. It's a credit to Lawrence, it's a credit to, to, to Shane to be honest. Would you get involved, Matthew, if 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 somebody was brought to Campbell and you thought I don't like the look of this opponent. I think maybe this is is, is too much of a, a, a level above to, to take him up to or, or something like that. Did, <coughs> has there ever been an occasion? Do you think there would be an occasion where you would turn around to a, a promoter or a matchmaker over and say, no, that's that's not the right fight for us? 100%. And I think, you know, Campbell's been put into some difficult positions early on in his career. And, you know, myself, who, who's, who's had a professional license in various different capacities since 19, you know, I'd be a fool to sit back. Same with his dad. You know, his dad's been around the sport, achieved great things. When it comes to boxing, there's there's not many people going to tell me and Ricky things about boxing. And, and you touched on it before about Canelo and stuff like that. The good thing about these top fighters, they have top teams around them as well. You know, the likes of your Canelo and, and your Mayweathers, great, great fighters, but they're surrounded by the right people. They've got smart, intelligent people around them. And Canelo will go nowhere near at Lawrence Acola because he's, he's a fantastic fighter, isn't he? You will see him at cruiserweight. You might even see him at heavyweight one day. But the people around will make the right moves. And, and certainly Lawrence Acola is such a dangerous fight. That's not good news. So that's the thing about these top fighters. Yeah, the top fighters. That's why they're at the top. But they're surrounded by the right people. And they've got great teams around them. Some very clever, clever people. By the same token... Shane, do you find it still frustrating that sometimes when fights that should get made don't? You mentioned a, a Brady there and what have yeah. you. Because the, the, the belts are there. Lawrence wants to unify. We all want to see that. We'd love to see that. But he's made no bones about the fact that sooner or later, if that doesn't happen, he's off up to heavyweight. I think the next one might be up at heavyweight. I think we could do what, what David Hay did, just dabble up there and then come back down. Because I don't see why, why not. He doesn't need to fill into his frame and spend two years to sort of put muscle on he can go up he can he'll be able to knock out most most heavyweights just with his own size and stature now he's, right opportunity he's, raises yeah, said because because he's you know because he's sharp he's he's got phenomenal power i mean i take dan de Bruyne of pads and, and lawrence isn't far behind him when it comes to punching power and, and dan is arguably one of the most heavy-handed guys in the, in the uh, heavyweight division so you know he he's he, when they're a fraction slower He's going to be getting off more and he'll have the speed advantage. And he won't be able to linger on the inside and tie them up and try and <laughs> slow things down because that's that's their game. But if we if we put someone like a Chris Ariola in front of him, I believe he'd knock him out. So why not go up there, make good money, and then if one of the champions do want to try and unify them, we've still we've still got our belt. But lingering around for people, I mean, it's just like you're just wasting time. And he boxed two times last year. That's not enough. You know, for a guy that's trying to maximise his career, he needs to be boxing three, four times a year. And if the opportunity is up at heavyweight, then we'll, we'll go there. 
some things never change, do they, Rick? Because I mean, there the, the were there were so I'm many fights. Say, I'm going to go. No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, <laughs> <laughs> there, there were so many fights that that you maybe could have had that were talked about. I mean, people like Miguel Cotto and Oscar De La Hoya, for example, <coughs> that they never materialised because we've still got the problem of, of of boxing politics to an extent, haven't we? I mean, and that's that's always going to be there in the background. Nine times out of ten, well, pretty much nine times out of ten, the boxers always want the fights. You know what I mean? When you look at the heavyweight division, you're not going to tell me that AJ and Tyson don't want the fight. That's then that is politics but I mean I pretty much you know I thought Mayweather I thought Pacquiao I thought Costa Zoo but I didn't but for some reason you know it didn't quite happen with Cotto or Gatti or you know or, or you know someone you know like that and it wasn't for no no reason I think at the time I thought Costa Zoo and I think just before that Gatti fought Mayweather and I think at the time when they were talking about me fighting Cotto I think Cotto fought Malinardi you know and, and it just for no other reason and I think if you spoke to Miguel Cotto, if you spoke to Juan Manuel Marquez, because we were all linked, Sir Gatti, Mickey Ward, we were all linked together. Great fights then, weren't they? For you lot, not me, maybe. <laughs> but, you know, we were all linked together. And for one reason, they didn't happen for no other reason. That, you know, that just we went on a different route. But I think you could say to all them fighters, if, they, if the opportunity did come along, we'd have definitely had them. You certainly yeah. Would. I mean, we're but yeah, things. I get where you're coming from. Politics sometimes, you know, with rematch clauses and, you know, and, and stuff like that. It does make the game a little bit frustrating, which it has done lately in the heavyweight division, you know, when, you know, I mean, the, the third Wilder Fury fight was probably one of the best in, in, in what, in heavyweight history or certainly in the, you know, the modern, in modern, you know, recent heavyweight history. Um, um, to be honest, I think like, we, we, none of us were bothered about a third fight, you know, because we thought he, but he needed to get, but he had the rematch clause, and that's the frustrating part about the game sometimes. But it, it actually is part of the game. That brings me nicely on to, to one of the points I wanted to speak to you guys and, and get your opinions on. You mentioned rematch clauses. Now, apparently, there is a rematch clause uh, in the uh, Kelbrook and Amir Khan fight that we saw last week, and a lot of people are saying, right, it's, it's <coughs> clearly now time for Amir Khan to, to put the gloves down. Maybe it is for, for Kelbrook as well. What are your thoughts, Matthew, on, on when it becomes the right time for a fighter to, to call it a day? That's why I'm very fortunate, really, because I think I got out at the wrong time. You know, I'd had 52 professional fights, a lot of them at a very, very good level. And, you know, but I've always liked to think myself was pretty sensible. Um, and I knew it was the right time for me to stop. Those two guys you've mentioned there, for me personally, I would like to see both those guys retire now. I really would. For Kel Brook, he gets the dream ending, dream ending for any fighter. Mm. The last thing that sticks in his memory is that great night at the MEN, a victory over Amir Khan, and it doesn't get better than that. But, you know, money talks. It, it, it's easy for me to say, they got, you know, Kel Brook is going to get offered absolute monster money into to fight Chris Eubank or to fight Conor Ben. Um, so, but personally, I'd like to see Kel Brook stop, even though it was a fantastic performance. Great way to stop. Unfortunately, Amir, you know, I wouldn't like to see Amir in the ring today. I think it was pretty, pretty evident that he should stop now. But unfortunately, his story is like the story for, for, for most of us fighters. It, it doesn't usually happen on a high. It doesn't usually end on a high. And uh, and that's why if it was Kel, uh, I'd like to see him stop now. I'd, I'd like to see both guys stop now. It is rare, isn't it, Shane, for, for fighters to go out with a, a fairy tale ending like that. Have, have you been in a situation where you thought one of your fighters has, has maybe gone on too long and, and, and you've had to have a difficult conversation at some point? No, I've actually been lucky. I haven't had to, had to have that. Um, you know, it was when Luke got beaten by Ryan Garcia, he said to me in the changing rooms, I think that's me done now. This is right. I think that's the right decision because he had uh, Levi's little boy, which was only a couple of months old. And, um, you know, George Groves after the Callum Smith fight, actually after the Eubank fight, he says to me, I think that's me done. In that when we were going to the to the um, hospital in the ambulance and his arm was hanging out, he says, oh, I think that's what am I without my jab? But money talks and there was a massive fight there. Obviously, you know, you couldn't couldn't go out on that but you know, he, he called it he called it the right time after that one because he didn't pick up too much damage but when you see fighters going on far too long um, you know I mean for instance with David I had that that fight with David Hay with Belly the first one and he shouldn't have been in there he shouldn't you know he, he didn't want to be in, involved with boxing and the fact that he went and did the neck the, the return as well it just it just showed that his his mind was on 
trying to his mind was on trying to get himself back to where you know find maybe financially or whatever trying to get himself back to his, his heights where it's like the 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 end goal should always be if you don't want to step in the gym and you don't want to get up and do the running and do the training and do the diet and then it's time to pack it in um and you know my, my dad he retired at 29 years of age and he got he got an offer from Don King in 1992 um he, so he retired in 89 he got an offer in 1992 and he'd <laughs> he'd lost a lot of money and he could have done with with you know, a three fight deal, and he was getting offered five million dollars to have three fight deal, any opponents he wanted, and he turned it down. Um, and that just shows that, you know, he, he he realized that his love for boxing was no longer, and 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 it wasn't a fi- it wasn't a financial thing at the end. It was it was, you know, if you don't want to go in there and, and, and take the punishment, then then you shouldn't do it. And it was pretty evident with Amir Khan backstage seeing him walking around. He you know, he didn't want to be there, and uh, it's definitely right time for him and. Going to Kelbrook, I think same thing. Go out and go out on a high. You know, um, Carl Froch went out on a high in 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 Wembley, and I think it's uh, it's very admirable. You went through it, didn't you? In terms of of effectively having a retirement, and then coming back for for one more fight. But you've said yourself publicly, within two rounds of that that return fight, you realised that it just wasn't there anymore. Yeah, I knew after two rounds. You know what I mean? I was in the gym, I was sparring and everything like that. And you think, oh, I'm doing all right. Here. It's come back and everything. Else. But then the minute the bell went, you know, just not quite getting out of the way. You know what I mean? Not just just not quite getting the leverage, just falling short. You know, at the end, end of the punches and. And I knew after a couple of rounds, but I tried to dig in there and and like that. But I mean, I made my comeback for for different re- reasons. There was a lot of demons going on in my head, and I felt like I had to be there. And even though it maybe I, I don't know if I just had my nose just in front, and he got me with that body shot. But my um, my mine ended up in in defeat. Uh, but mine was was one of the best fights of my life. It made me listen. You haven't got it no more. You've not got hurt. You got it with a body shot. It made me get me um, me respect back, which I thought I'd lost because of other because of other other things, you know. So my even though it ended in defeat and I got stopped, it was a very very positive thing in my in my career and my life. But you do. Um, Amir should retire now, and I think Kelbrook should retire now. Matthew couldn't have summed it up any better. You know, the one thing you want to remember from your last fight is what Kel would have remembered. Great atmosphere. The place was absolutely bouncing. He put in a great performance. Amir can, you know, he's got to he's got to hang him up because I mean, when I got, I think there was just a bit more miles on the clock between Kelvin. They were at similar stages of the life and career, but there was a little bit more. When I got knocked out by Pacquiao, that was, you know, sometimes you don't come back from one of them knockouts, you know what I mean? But when you think, you know, I mean, I had Brady's Prescott, bang, Canelo, Garcia, there's three. For the um, Madonna fight, there was three rounds, four rounds where he was opening about all over the show. And you sometimes your body just can't come back from that. And because, you know, Kel had a had three destructive three or four destructive knockouts like Amir had. I think that's why you could see that Amir just wasn't, you know, just wasn't what he what he was. And it did you say there's a rematch clause and that you know, I'd say this would love to Amir. Nobody's gonna want to watch that in a rematch clause, you know what I mean? And Amir can go into retirement. You'd like to finish on a win, like you say, like Kelbrook should and hopefully will do and should do now. But I think Amir, even though he's gonna he'll be disappointed about that, he needs to get out now and, you know, he can still be proud of what he's you know, what he's uh, what he's uh, what he's achieved. Yeah, absolutely. A pair of them have had fantastic yeah. careers. That result was unequivocal. We could see exactly what, what was what there, but we're still getting as we saw a couple of weeks ago, um we saw uh John Ryder and, and Danny Jacobs, a lot of people uh, watching that fight, they weren't necessarily uh, agreeing with the uh, the judges in, in terms of the scorecards that that happened there. You've been on the end of it. You two when when Campbell fought at uh, Tottenham Stadium on the on the AJ Bell, there were people who were who were giving him a lot of criticism for for getting the win on that occasion as well. So the next question is, what do we do about the scoring system that we've got in boxing at the moment? It, it, it's difficult as it is. The 10-9, 10-8 system, does that work for you? Or do you feel there is there is another way? Are there other ways in which we can try and, and, and get results being more consistent and, and, as some people might say, perhaps more correct? 
blank faces all around here to start with. <laughs> it <was to> start. <laughs> Who wants to start on that one? I don't think there's anything. You, 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 I think there's, you know, we've tried over the years, haven't we? We're judging with the amateurs, you know, with the computer scoring. It's not worked, you know what I mean? And, you know, you're always going to get... The thing is, how many times do you sit in, sit in the pub or sit with your mates watching TV and, you know, and it's on a close, you know, it's a fight, you know, and... You go, I think I've won that. I think he's won that. You know, no, 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 I think he's won that. You know, you're always going to get that through, through boxing. And it doesn't matter how, how many you, you alter the rules to make it, you know, a 10 8 round or a 10 9 round or this or that. I think, you know, some people have different views. Some people like the boxer movers. Some people like the, you know, the, the, the in your face fighters. I think, you know, and when you've got three judges, you know, I don't think, I don't think there's any way around the. Yeah. The, the judging, I really, I really, I really, really don't. We've, I mean, we've been having how many conversations have we had over the years? What we should do about judging? How you chop it, change it? What you can do it? Computer scoring? Try this, try that. I think, I think it is what it is. Bad decisions are always going to come in the game because people will always have a different opinion. opinion. You know, is this what it all comes down to? It's, it's opinion at the end of the day. Do you think there's there's a case for saying that we should maybe see more draws? I think it's what, it, again, as Ricky said there, it's difficult because we're all different. We all see fights differently. We all some like, like different styles of boxing. And in, in some fights, you know, the, the close fights that could go either way. Um, but I think it doesn't really matter what job you do. You know, you judge, aren't you? Um, but what is annoying is when you see the same faces, the same judging, keep giving it away. Maybe there's some close fights where it's difficult to split. Um, like the fight you touched on there, you know, I thought they they got the wrong winner, but I wouldn't, you know, it was the closest fight. But some decisions you see are absolutely ridiculous, and you see the same faces giving these ridiculous scorecards, and they should be able to count. Should do like a ranking system, shouldn't they? You know what I mean? How many times he's put a bad decision? Then he's in the next. Yeah, but then he doesn't know. He's only he put a bad know. decision in because you think it's a bad decision. That's your opinion. Well, true. Isn't there it? is some fights though, isn't there, where you, you see it and <laughs> well, it's it, it's well, an obvious. Well, if if eighty percent of the people say, "Whoa, that was a wrong," and maybe you go with that, and you know, but then when they some of them judge fight after fight after fight after fight after you know stinkers, you know, maybe maybe yeah, there's a, it, maybe there's a way of looking at it that way. I don't know. But. I think a lot of the judges are tired by the time they get to the main event. I also think a lot of the time. The commentary doesn't help because there's a lot of times there's com commentators giving their opinions and then the audience go with the commentators. Judges opinion. can hear the commentators, can't they? <laughs> you know? But like, sometimes it's that maybe what, maybe what they should do is they should have a, a referee or a former referee and a judge working as a pundit saying, well, I think you're wrong because, you know, who's to say, even if it's a former fighter, they might be, they might not be watching the boxing properly. They, they'll be sitting there thinking, oh, that was a good shot, that was a good shot. And then when they come, come down to it, they haven't actually scored the round properly. They've just been, well, we as men, we can't multitask. So they've been chatting about the fight. Like, Who won that round? I don't know. Yeah, I'll give it to this one. And then it's like, then the audience is going with the commentators and not necessarily with the judges. And you can't get three corrupt judges. You might get one or two, but you ain't getting three. So there'll always be, uh, there'll always be uh, fairness, I think, when it comes to them. Listen, the British Boxing Board of Control have been doing this for years and we've never really had a bad reputation on... on um, it's not like Germany. Germany tends to you know, have some stinkers. Um, but, you know, over here, we've always been very fair. We've always given away fighters the benefit of the doubt. And I think um, if the commentators had someone to sort of guide them in the right direction and say, this is actually who's winning the fight and then the judges I think it'll be a bit more transparent Do you think because it is so much about opinions we're going to be having this debate for, forever and a day until somebody comes up with some kind of a system well, which is a, better is there a better it, system trying it, exactly. trying it. Yeah. But in America they judge they prefer pressure fighters do you know what I mean over here they they they, they they appreciate the boxers, the cleaner shots. They don't appreciate the the the, pre the person that's that's forcing the fight. So, you know, you you kind of got to go. You know, if 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 you're a UK person going across to America, you you can't just run away on the back foot and expect to win rounds. Even though you're catching them with the more eye catching shots, you you got to still force the fight. And if you're going in there against a champion, you've also got to try and do a bit more than what you know than than uh, than what you're you know. Yeah, you've got to do a little bit more to, to, to win the rounds. We'll throw it forward to Sunday night. Uh, Matthew, obviously, last time Campbell was out in Spain, great performance from him. Fingers crossed we see more of that and, and more of his development. 
<clears throat> Absolutely. Uh, the penny's got to drop last time. He was more relaxed in the build-up. He was more relaxed in the, in the ring. And Campbell's a good, good fighter. We've, we've not really seen that so much yet, apart from his last fight. But Campbell's a young fighter, and he should get better, and he should improve. We've certainly seen that in the gym, and hopefully we're going to start seeing that regular on fight nights now. So, uh, no, Campbell's had a great camp. Great performance last time out. Hopefully the pennies drop there. And I think we're going to see continued improvement fight by fight. Campbell starting on Sunday. Ricky, are you happy with the way his development's going so far? Absolutely. Like I said earlier, you know, with all the pressure on his shoulders and they had that, you know, bit of a, you know, not a great performance and he fought on the big bills and all that. His last performance was his best of his career. So with all that, that speaks, that speaks volumes. I think I speak from, I think even before his, his performance, I felt like he was rushing a little bit, you know, and, you know, not thinking about his things. And now he's had his, his last fight under his belt and he's seen what damage um, and what success he can have by just slowing it down and having a little bit more of a look. I think I speak for Matthew. We're like, we're hoping that the penny's dropped here now and he doesn't resort back to the old days of, you know, just, you know, throwing punches 10 to the dozen like a chicken with no head, not thinking about his attacks. That, you know, that, the penny should have dropped last time, you know, seeing that, you know, he can do more damage without working twice as hard as he was previously, you know, and I think that, uh, I think that will, I think that last fight will, will move him on and I, think, I don't think he's going to go back to the old days. No, I think um, it's early days. He's going to have more speed bumps along the way. He's only a baby, but uh, I think... Um, I think the the last fight was a performance, the success he got because he tweaked a few little things, I think was a massive eye opener for, for Campbell. We look forward to it. And Shane, massive night for you, obviously. We, we haven't really mentioned Anthony Fowler, but um, obviously he's stepping up a division as well. Is he going to look a, a bit better, a bit more comfortable, do you think, at, uh, at going up a division? Yeah, I think so. He's in a much happier place and um, he's really enjoying his training. He's, he's basing himself down in London. Um, he's got his 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 missus and his kids down here, so um, he's he's buzzing. Do you know what I mean? So excited about his move up to middleweight. I think with the British title being vacated by Felix Cash, I think that's a good option for us. There's also an option at, at European level. It's just been won a few months ago as well. So I think you're going to see a, a, a new, you know, not a new and improved, but a tweaked and a more happy and, and a bit more patient Anthony Fowler. And he's always had the power. Um, you know, we just need to go out there and make sure you know he learns from that from that last fight. There was so many things that he could have learned from it. Um, and you know, I believe if if he's if he's got that mindset to constantly keep progressing, then we're going to see a much better fighter. And as far as Lawrence is concerned, he looks in fantastic shape. He looks laser focused as well. He looks pretty happy too. What are you hoping for in terms of a performance from him on Sunday night? It's going to be tricky early. He's going to have to try and get his range in, take the centre. Uh, but I think once he starts landing on him, I think he'll knock him out halfway and. Uh, Halfway stages, I think look, it's going to be m m my most important thing is that he looks clinical doing it. He doesn't get himself in scrappy exchanges. And I think Seslak's the perfect opponent to make Lawrence Coley look, look fantastic. So let's hope we get two big wins. We wish you the best of luck. Well, gents, it's been an absolute pleasure, pleasure talking to you. Thank, thank you very, very much, much indeed for joining us. Shane, thank you. Matthew, thank you. Ricky, thank you. And thanks very much to you for joining us on From the Corner. We'll see you again very, very soon.